Okay, thank you, uh, Frank, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this morning at 8 o'clock. Uh, I know some of you are uh, jet-lagged. I've met a number of people I haven't seen for uh, a number of years, so uh, this is a really uh, great uh, reunion here. So uh, everybody, I'm sure, in this uh, beautiful venue is uh, aware of this uh, essay by Dubzansky, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. You're probably less aware of the uh, quote by my colleague Jim Vapel, Nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of demography. I decided that is the fitness of birth and death rates, and that's what demography is about, and obviously that's what fitness uh, concepts are, are about as well. So I decided I needed to weigh in on this so that everything in demography uh, begins to make sense in light of ent entomology. And so insects are a wellspring of demographic diversity. No other group of organisms provides the coherency and the completeness for developing a comprehensive biodemographic framework of theory and methods. Our field not only has huge opportunities for the creative application of existing demographic techniques, but also provides in the conceptual domain for creating new theory and discovering original demographic relationships that are of both basic and practical value. I discovered one in this life table identity that uh, Frank alluded to and I'll uh, talk about just uh, later in my presentation. But I have no doubt that there's many others. So insect biodemography is a study of insects at the individual cohort and population levels through the use of formal demographic theory, laboratory experiments, and field observations. I see insect biodemography as important to insect ecology, IPM, biocontrol, insect pathology, behavior, physiology, medical entomology, urban entomology, forensic entomology, invasion biology, apiculture, toxicology, and also relevant to even insect molecular biology and insect taxonomy and systematics. I consider biodemography uh, really fundamental to many of these, uh, not all of these areas, but certainly uh, many of them, IPM and ecology and so forth. You need to understand the individual, the cohort, and population levels. So the way I've organized uh, my presentation this morning, I have five different parts. First, I'll talk about insect lifespans, then part two, uh, insect mortality, insect reproduction, insect health, and insect uh, populations. And then I, uh, towards the end, I uh, uh, describe what I call four uh, biodemographic pearls. These are the beautifully simple mathematical relationships that I think all entomologists should know. So here's the call to bio biodemographic adventure. So insect lifespans, an overview. So here I did a, a little animation here just to uh, get things started on lifespan. Look, all insects, of course, have a lifespan, and I'm talking about adult insects here. That is, you have patrolling dragonflies may live two to four months. You'd have swarming mayflies. We have 24 to 48 hours or so for mayfly uh, adult uh, lifespan. This giant water bug may live one or two years. You may have uh, mayflies that live just a few weeks. Now, the, like all insect uh, traits, such as species-specific physiology, morphology, reproductive biology, species lifespans are also evolved traits that are part of their suite of interconnecting life history traits. So we, uh, this is uh, out of my, uh, one of the articles I wrote for an annual review. Some of you have probably seen this, but across the top I have days, weeks, months, years, and decades for adult uh, lifespan. This is schematic, it's not a graphic per se. I have hemimetabola here and holometabola. There is the uh, span of uh, virtually all insect species uh, from days uh, through uh, decades, basically. But we can go systematically through this, and that is for days, it's uh, uh, basically ephemeroptera, that is the mayflies, though there's some lefts that live just a few days. There's uh, weeks, many insects live one to uh, nearly four weeks. For example, aphids, gnats, butterflies, moths, parasitoids, and so forth. Okay, months. The lifespan of most insect species are in uh, the order of months. That's the vast majority live uh, this long. Dragonflies, uh, grasshoppers, weevils, fruit flies, many bee species. Years. These representatives narrow. So the majority in the whole metabola uh, are, the, are the ones that live years, with the exception of termite queens. Might include assassin bugs, of course, that's hemiptera. Tsetse flies, several beetles, uh, eusocial insect queens. Then we get to decades. And there's limited, basically, to the queens of uh, termites and ants. Both of these, by the way, are subterranean, but, uh, but they're a key part of the superorganism concept. Uh, basically, the insect floor plan is uh, constructed on uh, 
to live uh, a matter of weeks or months at most. Okay, so the carry away here, one of them, it would be there's a 5,000 fold difference in adult insect uh, lifespans. That's to be contrasted with uh, about a 50 to 75 fold difference in mammalian lifespans. So you have a mayfly one or two days, ant queens 25 or more years. Now, I find the interesting question is basically what factors favor the evolution of insect lifespan extremes? And so we have, uh, so is lifespan evolution. So we have a floor plan, that's a bow plan, a uh, phylogenetic uh, floor plan. And so that, uh, for example, you have orders, coleops versus lepidopterans. So the coleopterans are longer lived by design, by uh, floor plan. So they have the cuticle, uh, they have chewing mouth parts so they can acquire protein uh, in, in order to manufacture eggs, for example. In contrast, you have the leps, which are shorter lived by design in general. They have fragile wings, sucking proboscis, and they're pre-ovogenic. Of course, there's exceptions. You get down to the family and genus level and where you have the evolutionary ecology modifies lifespan within phylogenetic constraints. And so, for example, you might have the um, uh, potato beetle there on the left versus a goliath beetle, short-lived versus longer-lived, again, within constraints, or the shorter-lived butterflies versus longer-lived coleus and so forth, okay? Now, the longevity extremes. We look at, uh, I've divided these into what I call environmentally selected, uh, and this versus socially selected, I'll talk about that in a second. And that is what, uh, in uncertain environments, uh, I, I tell my class uh, that I teach, you know, the 100 year flood is good for some species, obviously not for uh, insects per se, but the concept still holds. And that is, that's the only time that the uh, conditions are uh, suitable for reproduction. And so they have to live through this dearth period, okay? Another concept here would be low resource for this, uh, for example, in the Namib beetle, it's the fog harvesting beetle. And that is, is where, I, again, I talk about it's like a bullion cube in a swimming pool. That is, the resources are there, but they're very thin. It takes a very long time for them to acquire the resources to grow and then uh, reproduce and so forth. Another uh, subcategory of the extremes would be socially selected. You know, uh, sociality and short life are inconsistent. You can't have it. You've got to have long life and sociality. I'll talk about that in a second, how they feed uh, back uh, on each other. But the queens are extremely long-lived, as I mentioned before. I'm sure everybody here knows this. Now, another extreme would be the truncated. It's not just understanding long life. It's also understanding uh, what the factors were to uh, uh, favor the evolution of short life. Everything has to come together for a mayfly. And so you have to have synchronous emergence. You can't spend days and weeks looking for mates, for example. So you have a swarm mating. Uh, and also near an overposition site. It's the same concept. You can't be spending days and weeks looking for a, a place to lay your eggs. So it all comes together. It has to all come together for this l short lifespan concept to work. Okay? Now, let's build on this sociality and longevity. And there's a famous uh, paper uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of by Howard Evans. In fact, it was at a uh, uh, co entomology congress back in 1958 and he wrote about the it was 13 stages of the evolution of sociality in wasps i've distilled it down to the uh, four concepts here and that is it's a coevolution of sociality and longevity when i read this paper there was one key part there where longevity played a very important role and it was just really resonated and so anyway, you have solitary parasitoid, that's where all uh, you know, wasps started. So you have, this is a host as a living incubator of the, um, of the uh, offspring. Uh, there's no nest and there's no parental care. These are basically short lived, but that's our starting point. Then the next uh, major stage here would be where you have mass provisioning. And so you see the nest there, so this is protected, uh, uh, favors uh, extend, extending longevity in adults. So the nest as the locus and nexus, and it provides protection. They're longer lived, but, and so they have fewer offspring, and there, there's, but there's no generation overlap. Now the next stage is where you get into progressive provisioning, and this is by like uh, feeding little birds, you know, as needed uh, provisioning. So now longevity is extended, there's generation overlap and the daughters as helper, helpers. This is a key uh, development, and that is you have extended longevity, set the evolutionary stage for incipient sociality. So that again, the progressive provisioning, this is a key development. The longevity of the mother extended to overlap with the daughters, that's thus creating this incipient sociality and the division of labor. Okay, And then this goes on so that now you have this self-reinforcing uh, concept here. 
uh, that is the queen's long-lived, but the worker is shorter-lived. You have this uh, major division of labor, and there's very low uh, pre-adult mortality. So the evolutionary bottom line is that you have longevity extension and social complexity are mutually reinforcing. That is, longevity extension sets a stage for greater social complexity, but then you have this division of labor, it sets a stage for greater longevity extension. Okay? So I used this concept a number of years ago to write a paper called Lifespan Extension in Humans is Self-Reinforcing, <clears throat> a general theory of longevity. So this is how it, it applied to humans. Anyway, next uh, month I actually am invited back to give to build on this paper. Uh, it's in fr uh, 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 colloquium in France. It's on sociality and longevity, and so I'm uh, going to be talking about the nest. The nest is a key concept, as we all know, that uh, in entomology uh, for social uh, insects. But also, it's a nest as a nexus in human evolution. The uh, the uh, anthropologists have not really uh, honed in on this the way I think they should. But anyway. You know that the, all the great apes, here's a chimp, they make nests. They make nests. And um, uh, platforms with kind of a bed and so forth. Anyway, I see this as the next step when you go to something like Australopithecus. This is going to be, they're not just going to have, they're not going to drop the nest concept. They're going to be building on it and refining it. So this might be, uh, you know, the ground version of Australopithecus, for example. This might be Homo erectus right in there. You get the idea. So it becomes progressively more, uh, more refined. And in fact, there's a lot of things. I think the first sleepover probably occurred uh, right there, uh, you know, back there. A lot of things start coming together when you uh, ha have this nest concept, uh, biparental care, uh, 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 pairing, and so uh, pair bonding and that sort of thing. Okay. Now move on to the uh, next part, insect mortality. Look, age-specific mortality is the most important uh, life table parameter. This is the probability an individual alive at age X will die before age X plus one. Mortality drives the life table. These are not co-equal parameters, the survivorship and LX and QX and so forth. Is mortality is the fundamental uh, risk concept that drives everything. So survival is subject to mortality risk. Life expectancy is subject to the mortality risk. The death distribution is subject to mortality risk, okay? So here would be a cohort of survival, the LX for humans, that we all use in uh, entomology, and it's handy, but it doesn't, uh, it's a summary concept, but it, it doesn't reveal that much. Uh, you get some general idea of how long they're lived, when 50% are dead, that sort of thing. Uh, you see a tail there at the end and so forth, but it's not very revealing. It's a summary concept. It's age-specific mortality, which is really provides uh, much deeper uh, insights into the biology and actuarial properties of, uh, of uh, insects and humans or whatever you're studying. So that here would be a schematic. This isn't a scale. It's to make this point. You have age-specific mortality on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. This would be uh, the, how it's shaped. So you see with infant mortality, one out of 500 uh, newborn die before age one. One out of 8,000 newborn girls, uh, not newborn, 11-year-old girls die before age 12. This is the lowest of the entire life course. Uh, unbelievable, one out of 8,000. Uh, then you go to age 50, one out of 400 uh, 50 year olds die before 51, and then it's a flip of the coin by the time you're 110, and that is 50% uh, of 110 year olds, and, but also centenarians, die before the next year. That is 111 in this case. Okay? And then also with mortality, you have a, a, a uh, section of this, a major section from about the mid 30s to the late 80s and 90, which is basically um, exponential. And so this is a Gompert uh, portion of the curve. It's 8%. I always tell my class, you know, once you turn 30, there's good news and bad news. The good news is you gain 8%. The bad news is it's in mortality risk. Anyway, it goes up at uh, 8% a year through that. So that the bottom line, it's not really possible to truly understand the actuarial properties of insect cohorts and populations without understanding age-specific mortality, that is the QX. Okay? Now, this is a study, old age mortality. We, we tested this hypothesis back in the uh, late 80s, but anyway, it was uh, the idea that lifespan is fixed. This was a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that is you can't do anything about lifespan, uh, no matter how many bran muffins you eat and take care of yourself, exercise, and so forth. Okay, so that we, um, 
uh, uh, hooked up with this, uh, well, it was James Vapel putting together an NIH program. And so we would test a uh, hypothesis. This is uh, down in Tapachula, Mexico. And that is, if there's a fixed uh, lifespan, then you should, as mortality approaches that age, an age at which some can attain but nobody can live beyond, then the mortality should go straight to the, through the ceiling, okay? Uh, so we can test that. And we test that using, this is in uh, Tapachula with Pablo Lieto and his uh, 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 technicians there. And that is a grow uh, medflies by the ton so that you can really create large life tables. This is located in Guatemala border. And uh, uh, anyway, it's a huge opportunity for actuarial studies of insects. Now, so the basic design was we had 267 cages of 4,500 flies, give or take, mixed sexes, and a total of 1.2 million flies total. So here is the uh, main result, um, and that is, um, again, age on the uh, X and uh, mortality on the Y. And so you can see from uh, uh, eclosion to about the mid-20s, maybe 30 days or so, it's fairly linear. And so if you had small numbers, you just say, well, let's just extrapolate, and clearly it just uh, continues to increase. But in fact, when you have big numbers, then you can uh, have a, a large enough, uh, uh, indi uh, uh, enough individuals at, the, uh, at these ages where the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, trajectories are uh, meaningful. And that is, uh, so anyway, it began to slow, uh, slow down, and then by the time uh, about two months or so is that it began to decline. And so you see here the rapid increase. So this is what you get when you have big numbers. We can do that with insects. And that is then we have a shoulder. This turned out to be really interesting. I don't go into the details there, but it's real. We thought it might be noise, but it's not. It's real. And then you have a peak here. Why did it peak at 50 or 60? Didn't it peak in 30 or 100 and, uh, you know, days or whatever? There's the peak. And there's a decline. All these have uh, deeper uh, physiological and biological uh, roots. So anyway, but the bottom line was that it's slowing at mortal above mortality at the oldest ages. It does not go uh, straight through the ceiling. So the main findings are, again, that the mortality slows at older ages. There's no wall of death, and lifespan is indeterminate. And so this is different than uh, infinity. Uh, this is people say, well, can you live forever? No. It's uh, just like chickens lay uh, not a fixed number of eggs, but an indeterminate, that's where the term comes from, is uh, ornithology actually, uh, or indeterminate growth. But in fact, you can't live to infinity, but you can't point to an age to which people, or in this case flies, can live and nobody, n none can live beyond, okay? Why were 1.2 million flies needed? Well, we view it, this is a, a, a metaphor from uh, Jim Vapel, but he views it like the Hubble telescope. With a big number of fly, large number of flies, you can peer into the far reaches of the fruit fly actuarial universe. So for example, if you have mortality rate again on the y-axis, age on the x, if you have say 100 flies, you can get out for a, uh, you know, a couple weeks or so uh, with the numbers because they're always dying. You need, you're always running a new bioassay at each age. Uh, you know, you really can't get very far with that. With a thousand, you get out to a few weeks before it really gets noisy and it's pretty much, uh, you know, run out of flies basically. You get to 10,000, then you can start to see the leveling off and you get to 100,000, you can get out to the peak and the shoulder and so on and so forth. That's why you need these uh, large numbers if you can use them. Now the carryaway message for the use of age-specific mortality is that you can gain deeper actuarial insights uh, by, by uh, uh, using uh, uh, age-specific mortality, but it requires large initial numbers. So if you can use the, have uh, large numbers, go for it, because clearly you're going to get the mean, but also you're going to get these deeper uh, 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 patterns uh, that uh, have a lot of uh, meaning. Now, sex mortality crossover. When we had our 1.2 million, Pablo and I, uh, and others, and we had our 1.2 million, you'd think that you could, and they were mixed sexes, and you saw the trajectory there, which is right there. Uh, you'd think you'd, uh, you know, click a couple uh, uh, commands on Excel, and you'd have a straightforward, which lived longer, the males or the females? It's not so simple, but it's really interesting. So here it is. When you disaggregate these from the composite to the, age, the sex specific, you see that pattern right there is that the males and females have different tra mortality trajectories. So that we can look at this, where we have the female, male, replotted them here. So you see in the young ages, the female, mortali female mortality is higher, okay? Then you have a crossover. This crossover is really interesting, because before that, you have 
uh, females aging faster. If you talk about actuarial aging, the rate of change in uh, mortality versus a f uh, male. And then at the crossover, you have the males uh, aging at a faster rate at the older ages. And then they uh, decline about the same. Okay, so that look, if you look at life expectancy, these are all uh, plotted 267 cages, is that if males and females lived exactly the same, this is male life expectancy on the uh, bottom and uh, female on the y-axis, is that then it should, they should fall right on that diagonal line if they were exactly equal, but they don't. So you can see expectation of life at age zero favors males in almost all the cages. There's a few uh, that don't, but by and large, it's, it's pretty distinct. And then you go to age 30 at the older ages, and you see that that favors the females, okay? And so this is interesting. We, this is what we published a paper following our uh, earlier one. Male, we called it male-female paradox. Males have the highest life expectancy, but the females are the last to die. Really interesting. Now, follow-up sex mortality investigations. We did studies, this is, these aren't at the millions, but they're in the 100,000 range. And again, you have mortality on the uh, Y and age on the X. And so now, you have different diets. It's sugar-only diet. Here's male trajectory of mortality. And follow the males because they're fairly consistent here. It's the female trajectories that, are, uh, that drive everything, you'll, as you'll see. So there's the female mortality. Now look at that. So now you have, again, like our original study, this is sugar-only diet, the females um, uh, have the highest mortality at the young ages, but now you have the crossover at about two weeks or so, and then the males are higher uh, than females. Now, well, watch this. Full diet, that would be with sugar and yeast, and so now we have the males, it looks more or less like the last one, but now the females, look at this. So that now the male is higher mortality, the crossover is a later ages, and then the female mortality uh, is higher at the older ages. Just the opposite, uh, with some details uh, different uh, of um, what we saw the last slide. Now, try again. One other um, condition here would be when we sterilize them, they're still given full diet. There's the male trajectory, again, looks about like the last one, the last two, but look at that, the female. So that there we are, there's no crossover. And so that uh, the males are higher than the females, but there's no crossover. The main results here, sex mortality differentials are age and context specific. You can't say males live longer than females or females live longer than males. You have to specify the context and for that matter, the age, okay? And then the female uh, mortality response drives the sex mortality differential. You saw that the uh, male uh, trajectory for all the diets was more or less the same. Uh, but the females are the ones that, uh, that really drove the differential because they bounced around from uh, very low uh, if they're sterilized to very high if they're given full diet, okay? Now, next, I go to uh, insect reproduction. I have two uh, parts to this. And the first one is basically technical, more technical than substantive, but it's visualizing individual level reproduction. And so that the way we approach this, this is back in the late 90s, uh, yeah, right in there, that uh, we published a paper, uh, we call it event history uh, uh, charts of uh, survivorship and egg laying. But the idea here is that you have an individual fly life course depicted right there, 10 days, okay? Now, each, uh, and this is an individual fly, each age, she lays a number of eggs, or, or not. In this case, uh, at age zero, she didn't lay any, one, two, so this, this is pre-reproductive period. So you color code those green. And then one to 50 eggs, yellow, yellow, and then at age five, she lays uh, over 50 eggs and so forth. So you get the idea here. Now, you do this for 1,000 flies, and these are individual. You uh, have horizontal lines uh, ordered from top to bottom, shortest to longest, and what emerges is a survival curve. But with the color coding, you have the, um, the, also the individual uh, uh, level egg laying. So for example, with the medfly, look at that again, that would be the pre-reproductive period, it's about three to five days. You can contrast that with the Mexican fruit fly, which is about 10 day reproductive period, but you can see really fine detail here. 
Now you look at the red, this is red is higher versus the yellow, and that would be there's peaks there that there's intense uh, reproduction from say 10, 20 days right in there throughout the cohort. This is a thousand flies in each of these cohorts. And uh, versus the mech fly, which is intermittent egg laying, you see just differences in egg production strategy there. Then you go to the end of life, so look at that again. So there's a short post-reproductive period in the medfly. You see that trailing uh, diagonal there at the end of life there versus the mex fly is that there's a post-reproductive period at 60 days and beyond right in there, okay? Now look, there's 37,000 data points in the top one and 50,000 in the uh, bottom one. That is 37 and 50 day life expectancies and 1,000 flies each. It's, uh, you capture a huge amount of data in a small space, and this is diagnostic. You can look at this, uh, you know, these are uh, a way to visualize that you don't get just with the mean and variation and that sort of thing. Now, just by the way, how, how you make this, it's basically a heat map, and you can create this in uh, Excel. So you make a rectangle like this, you have your, uh, where you see the uh, survival uh, 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 curve right there, that's where the real data is, and beyond that to the right would be, I put in minus one to code it, and then you go to conditional formatting on your Excel, and you can make a heat map. We published this uh, back uh, about 15 years ago or so. You can track down if you're interested. Now, another uh, interesting, uh, at least I, con we, I consider interesting, uh, uh, study in reproduction is where we, this is again down at Tapachula with Pablo Lieto, uh, did food pulses. And that is if you have age from left to right and we have sugar only diet and then we give them a pulse of the yeast sugar, so for one day and then they back to sugar and then give them another pulse for one day. And so that here is the, you see the results right in here, every day, second day, third day, fifth, tenth, twentieth, and so forth, okay? I still remember when I got the data uh, <clears throat> from Mexico on this and I plotted this, just uh, we, we didn't know quite what to expect, but uh, the idea is just beautiful uh, oscillations. So that uh, there it is. But I'm going to focus on uh, the five-day cycle, the 10-day, and the 20-day uh, cycle right in here. And I replot these. We frame the graphics for 50 days of reproduction for the 5, 10, and 20-day pro protein yeast cycle. Okay, so that you see with the top, we have nine cycles because there's a pre-reproductive period. This is a mex fly. Nine cycles in the 50 days for uh, the top one. Uh, that's every five days. And then five cycles for every 10 days of the 50 day period. And then three, a little less than three cycles for the uh, bottom one, right in there. And so we partitioned into the reserve and the surge component. So the reserve you see at the top there would be 70% what we call the preserve reserve, and that would be the, where the, uh, where, where the uh, top of the trough is, or the bottom of the trough, however you look at it there. And so uh, with a five-day cycle, they haven't run out of uh, protein, so to speak, to manufacture eggs, and so they have a pretty good, good reserve there versus the uh, yeast. And so that 70%, 30%, and 5% in the base for the graph shown top to bottom, thus 30, 70, 95 in the surge, right? Note that there's exactly a third of the eggs in the 20-day cycle relative to the five-day cycle. They received uh, three times more food pulses in the top one than the bottom one, and it's exactly scaled that way. Now, let's look at it another way, this same data set, and that is we have the cycles, but we're going to make them composite. And so they average over all uh, cycles within, um, uh, within one of the treatments, okay? So that now we have reproductive partitioning in the pre and post pulse. And so you see at the top uh, where you have the five-day cycle, the middle is the 10-day uh, cycle, and the, uh, 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 every 10 days they get a new pulse of uh, yeast, and then the bottom would be the 20-day cycle. So here's the main results, and that is you have an immediate increase. It doesn't show it quite as much here, but that is uh, as soon as they get new protein, they start laying more eggs. This could not possibly be they synthesize new eggs, so they tap into their reserve, whatever that is, left, and begin laying eggs. It's like a signal that says, okay, I can lay eggs because I have more in the pipeline, okay? Now, the total eggs uh, per cycle is food limited, not uh, time limited. Basically, you have five day cycle at the top, you see 60 eggs for that, and you have a 20 days, four times as much at the bottom, and that's 70 eggs, and there's some difference, but not, it's not huge. And so it's basically food limited, not time limited. 
Note also that the peak is independent of cycle length, so they always peak at this day four or so, uh, regardless of the cycle. And uh, there's a gradual decrease, of course, as you'd uh, uh, expect in egg production in the post-food cycle. And there's limit, and you can look at the bottom one there, the limit of about three weeks, 20 days, 21 days, right in there, per one day protein. So that by the time they get to 20 days, they're still laying eggs, but it's maybe every other day or so, and they're just laying on fumes, okay? Now, here's a carryaway, uh, a couple carryaways. Egg production, I mentioned, is more food limited than time limited. And look, this last point I made, the single day feeding can last a lifetime. So if a lifetime in the field is about three weeks, you get one good shot at uh, acquiring uh, protein, and these fruit flies can be, uh, lay eggs over a three-week period, okay? Now, insect health. I see there's a symposium on uh, health uh, as in crop uh, protection and so forth, but we're talking here about insect health. I uh, deal with um, uh, you know, funding through NIH, the National Institute of Health, and so they're interested in this uh, too as a health concept. And, uh, but also I've learned a lot from <coughs> the uh, demographers about health demography, and I bring some of this to bear uh, to this uh, talk. Now, I, I couldn't resist putting this uh, uh, cartoon in. Okay, so anyway. So anyway, you have sequence analysis of behavior. Now look, here's an example of the triplet code of nucleic acids used by bioinformatics researchers to identify patterns of the tens of millions of the uh, nucleotides A, C, T, G, and so forth, right? Okay, these are used to construct nested dendrograms to illustrate visually and characterize numerically the hierarchical clustering of genes as shown here. Now, Demographers studying the life course use this genomics-inspired concept of sequence analysis to analyze the timing and sequence of events of, a sta of states in a person's life. Uh, here the thread is not DNA, but time, okay? So for example, they might use single, married, widowed, and divorced as the uh, sequence. So here this person is single for, you know, single, 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 and so forth. For those of you who are single, then he or she marries for those years, so each one is coded as an M, and then widowed um, uh, for these last ones. A person two years single, years married, divorced, so it's a bit of a different pattern. But anyway, you take this over tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you have life courses, and you can begin to construct dendrograms of similarities. Now we do the same thing with flies. And so that, again, back in Tapachula, we did this with Pablo Lieto uh, <clears throat> and uh, created a behavioral monitoring system. And so here would be 27 example, uh, 27 seconds in the life of a fly, eight seconds walking. So again, this is coded WW, whatever, resting, uh, and then feeding, and so forth. You get the idea. So now we have a behavior uh, uh, defined in, in terms of the sequence, uh, sequences, okay? Now, Here's the schematic of the setup where we had a camera, two lights, and we had the cages, fly cages right in there. And so disregard that partition in the middle. It's a virtual partition for the purposes of a, of a paper we published. But anyway, there's a fly resting, say, so they're monitoring. And then it shows up on the other side of the cage. It couldn't just instantaneously walk there. It had to fly, so it would be coded flying, and then walking, and then feeding, and so forth, OK? So you'd have, a for a single fly, for 120, that lived 120 days, you get some uh, uh, you know, sequence like this where each horizontal line is a day in the life of a fly. Now, what we did is take each age category here in terms of 10 days, so this would be the behavioral sequences we recorded for all the flies over a 10-day period, and ask the question, how would they break out with respect to a dendrogram clustering? Would the youngest ones be, uh, say, zero to 10 days and middle age from 30 to 50 and the others old or whatever? We're gonna see here. So what you have here, so there's the first uh, uh, sort of breakout, and that is from the, uh, the first clustering would be all to the left there of 10, 20, 30, and 40, and so forth. There's something similar among those, their behavior, and you see the, the age class zero to 10, basically, in a different, is more like middle age. So we see the middle age right in here, that's where it broke out, and then this would be the older ages, okay? So that here you'd have the grouping number one, so you see what the behavior, uh, uh, was like, uh, you know, similar uh, behavior sequences would be 10, 20, 30, 40 days right in there, excepting the zero. Then all of these would be a similar uh, uh, 
in at least in a broad sense of the behavioral sequences, and then you have the older ages. So there would be just descriptive, but now say you wanted to compare the behavior of yeast uh, sugar diet versus sugar only diet. So you can see here where the breaks out the behavior of youth is different for the yeast uh, sugar diet, that is they're laying eggs actually so that uh, they become older faster, versus a sugar diet. So you see w the one we just uh, looked at there, it's a long youthful period. Then the uh, middle age would be about the same duration but the onset is different. And then the old age for the yeast sugar diet is much longer and onset much earlier than the sugar only diet. You get the idea here. So entomological applications, you'd have basic behavioral studies. Uh, uh, this could be applied to uh, the searching behavior, the lifetime activity and behavior, which is what we did, but also quality control. So you're bringing some analytical rigor to the behavioral studies when you look at it this way, okay? Here's another one, a category of insect health. <clears throat> And this is uh, what, what a study we did with uh, Nikos Papadopoulos, um, Byron Katsianos, Nikos uh, Kalousis in Greece. So they're close colleagues that I've worked with a lot. They discovered this, and that is what they call sip, uh, supine behavior uh, uh, in medflies. And that is monitoring males, in this case, for their entire life, uh, two hours a day, and they record and so forth. That's the detail for the moment. And then you have supine. So they end up on their back, but they're not dead. And just a few months ago, I ran across this supine. It might be tonic immobility, similar to what uh, opossums and other animals and uh, organisms uh, exhibit. It's a little bit like that. It just occurred to me that might be what's going on. But anyway, they're not dead. They can get up and uh, you know feed and even uh, do the mating uh, calls and that sort of thing. And then, of course, there's dead. So now you have a gradation from live and an intermediate, uh, less than healthy state, uh, we call supine, and then the dead. And so here's what uh, an, this event history graph would look like for the supine behavior. And that would be where, uh, go back here, and that is again age and the excess. Each horizontal line is an individual and then the onset and, and so forth is supine. Uh, red is the worst, uh, the most frequent. But anyway, you can see here, it's not age specific, it's time to death specific. So that now we have a model of medfly health, and this would be healthy, pre-supine, only 1% of the 200 and some odd uh, males that uh, they monitored died without first going to the supine condition. All, the vast majority went to the supine, exhibited that behavior before they died. So now you have this transition, it's universal, that is virtually all the flies experienced this. You'd have progressive, so that once it started it became worse. It's predictive, so once it started you know they have about two weeks left. And then it's uh, irreversible, and that is uh, none of them really recover from this. Once they onset, they move forward. Now, uh, disregard that life expectancy. This is basically survival. And that is, you have, this is, uh, there's an area of, uh, you know, uh, healthy life expectancy concept in human demography, and that's what I apply here. And that is, you have total life expectancy of 62 days there. This would be just a survival curve. But now you have active life expectancy. So now there's different endpoints in life than death. There's an onset of uh, being sick and gradations of sick and so forth. Well, in this case, it would be the onset of uh, the supine uh, behavior. And so now you have the end of active life expectancy of about 49.8 days, 50 days, uh, versus 62 days. So now you have 12.83 days on average that the fly experienced poor health there. Okay, so the implications, applications, that is nearly one in five days is spent in the unhealthy state with that, uh, that is post-supine uh, but pre-death. Uh, you can study insect health gradients, sublethal effects and patterns, so it doesn't have to be a dichotomy like I have here, it could be different levels of uh, uh, illness, so to speak, or uh, fitness, or whatever. Okay, monitor health in uh, natural populations. We're doing some of that with uh, my graduate student, uh, Sarah Silverman, and that is you can do um, uh, uh, activity patterns or whatever. I think you could do flight mills and so forth. It'd be post-capture uh, uh, behavior. And then pest control strategies can be based more on the health concepts. Maybe we don't have to kill everything. I know this is already uh, considered in uh, insect pathology and, and to an extent in toxicology, but it could be just simply making them sick. Okay? Now, next part, the last part is insect populations. And the first one is this uh, uh, life table identity that uh, now has come to be known, as uh, Frank mentioned, as uh, the Carey's equality. I, I discovered this, and it's really uh, uh, pretty interesting, actually. And so here it is. Here's the concept. Um, that is, 
you look at the left there and a fly is born, that is an adult, it closes as an adult, and it lives a life for an unknown period, and then at this red dot, it's captured. And it captured, now we can monitor the, uh, the rest of its life in the laboratory, okay? Or it could be captured, uh, if you can monitor an animal in the field, for example. What does that captive segment tell you, okay? The problem is, you don't know whether you captured it a day after it was uh, born or the day before it turned 100 days. Uh, you have no clue. And uh, so, we're going to see. So look at this. Here's a schematic. And that is, you see to the left, the red line down the middle would be the time of capture. So everything to the left, I shade out because it's unknown. This would be the pre-capture time, pre-capture segments. And to the right would be the post-capture so we can monitor those. Now look so that you see that there are different ages based on those wavy lines and so forth to the left under the shaded area. So they're different ages of capture. Uh, but even if they're different ages, you look at this, four, five, seven, and nine, these are different ages of capture based on the left uh, curvy line uh, and so forth, but they died exactly one day after they were captured in this hypothetical concept. So that individually, that information gives you uh, no information. Uh, because nine is very old when it died, and uh, number four was just born, basically, and it lived one day in capture. So, how to determine the age structure of a stationary population, that's the assumption here, a non-growing population, without knowing the age of any single individual within it. So here's a hypothetical population <clears throat> of whatever, several hundred individuals. We don't know their ages, but I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna show you the ages, and they're all color-coded right here, so we have a mixture, and we're going to sample these in proportion, and bring them back to the lab, in proportion to their abundance in this population we see right there. So that now we sampled them, we have them in a cage there, I just order them, and so you can see the age structure of that population is 40 newborn, 30, uh, 1, 25, 2, and uh, 5, 3 in this uh, hypothetical. So that's the sample. Now we're going to survive them forward, okay? I'm gonna do that again. So in other words, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, survive them forward in the lab so every age class is going to contribute to the deaths the first day. So see that? These are post-capture deaths. So every age class stacked up there, those are the deaths on day from zero to one, basically. Now we're gonna do that again, and every age class that's left contributes to the deaths there, and so on and so forth, okay? and then we're down to the last ones. So now we have from left to right, deaths day, day zero to one, one to two, two to three, and three to four. Now look, there's where we started. And so that there's, this is a life table identity. And that's what they're calling, uh, demographers now call Carey's equality. Demographers didn't discover this because they knew age. Entomologists, age is a big deal because we don't know it. We're trying to, uh, we'd like to know it and so forth. So that, if you know time to death, so if we had a black box of all those individuals at the top, we had no clue what the age was, we could still get age structure for a stationary population from the death distribution from that black box. It'd be 40, 30, 25, and five, okay? So the death, here's this, there's the property. The death distribution of randomly captured individuals of unknown age in a stationary population reveals its age structure. So that's property one. Time to death distribution of a stationary population equals its age structure. There's a second property uh, that's related. That is the proportion of individuals uh, X days old in a population, this is stationary, is equal to the proportion that have X days to live. If you think about that just a little bit. But here's the schematic. So think about uh, the Culex pipians. This is actually, I know this looks like a long time, 90 days and beyond, but that's what they lived post-capture. But there's a Culex pipians uh, that uh, Nikos Pap uh, Papadopoulos uh, collected post-capture <coughs> in Greece. There's a proportion, uh, so that's a proportion Ajax, but now here's the fraction of that stationary population that's exactly 90 to 95 days old. Okay, let's say it's 5%, okay? that would equal exactly the fraction that have 90 to 95 days yet to live, let's say 5%, okay? So you can see the new, the closed, uh, greater proportion of those have 90 to 95 days to live than those that are 50 days old. 
Uh, and in fact, after 50 days, nobody, no, no individual has, can live 90, 90, 95 more days. But anyway, that's the property, okay? Those are exactly equal, okay? So here's a several papers that we published from that. And uh, so anyway, there, there that is. But the thing is that stationary populations, of course, are unrealistic in the field, so we want to be able to apply this. And so it's what we uh, developed called captive cohort methods. And just to illustrate this concept uh, as a thought experiment. So I have on the left there the apocalypse now environment. This is going to be like the field, right? And then I'm going to transfer them to Happy Valley, all right? And so this would be like in the laboratory. <clears throat> now, if we had in the population A uh, versus population B war evacuees, so we're going to fly them out of the war zone into Happy Valley. Yeah, but we can't, we, all we have is the death records of uh, post, post transfer, okay? Now, we see population A that they had 70 years yet to live on average, although some died earlier and so forth, all right? What statement could we make about them versus population B where we had a skewed, what is that, 23 days or so mean, but they didn't live as long, okay? So there's what we have. And so at least qualitatively, we can say that those individuals from uh, population A were younger because their death distribution post-transfer was older. And we're assuming no war trauma and all that business. Okay, versus the population B at the bottom, these were older individuals. So at least qualitatively, just from the post-capture or post-transfer death distribution, we can make general statements about uh, the age structure of the population from which we uh, collected individuals. Now, uh, I set the stage here, so now you have a spring population of medflies, you find that they live 70 days post-capture versus the fall population may live uh, 20, uh, 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 23 days in this case, so you get the idea. And so that uh, now, with that as a concept, we collected this, this is back with uh, uh, Papas, uh, Nikos Papadopoulos, Clusus, and Byron Katsianos, collected these in Greece every single day, we call this fine grain sampling. And uh, so every day we're collecting medflies, ship them. Here you have, see, June through November, collected 2,000 uh, flies, uh, individual flies. So each one of these lines is the length of life of an individual fly. So you can see from the top there, this would be the maximal trends, 60, 150, 70. The, even the minimal trends, I actually give you some information. Look at between September and October. Very few died for about the first month or so. It's actually really interesting and uh, so forth. There's the average trends. And from that, we get a seasonality. We can estimate uh, age, average age in this case. And so that um, you see in, uh, went from average age, our estimate would be 20, to average age of about 70 or so. And so you can think of that as back here, either it's an average of 40 days older or they've acquired the frailty equivalent to having aged 40 days, okay? So that's the concept here. Okay, now there's some papers that we publish. I fly by those pretty fast. Okay, the last one I have here, and that is uh, mosquitoes. This is Nikos Papadopoulos. You can see here it's some of my colleagues, Shirley Luckhart and Ed Lewis, uh, myself, but also Nikos was the lead author on this. Seasonality, post-capture longevity, and medically important mosquito. Captured, live captured 10 C. pipians every day, monitored in the lab through death, okay? We need to frame this to plot the data. So you see the days at the bottom from zero to 360, we started June 1, so that's our index at zero, and then across the top June through uh, May of the uh, following year, okay? So that this diagonal right here serves as a moving baseline for plotting times of capture and death and for seasonal uh, uh, visualizing changes in uh, longevity, okay? Now you have mosquito post-capture lifespan. This is an example. From the, uh, from the left there. So it was captured at the end of August. It was uh, died in the middle of December. So this is in the laboratory. Another one would have captured at the end of Oct October, died in the middle of March. Okay, 30, 60, 90 days, you get the idea there. There's all the data. So now you have mosquito lifespans, this is 1,500 uh, mosquitoes, June captures through November captures, there's your uh, 30, 60, 90 days. You can see right away that in, uh, say, July or so, there's fewer that cross the 90-day uh, line than, uh, say, October, November, keep pushing through here. So now you have, look at the, uh, at the end of the year. This is very long lived. Nothing had lived this long at the earlier in the season. So we look at a, take a close look at this. We think this is what's happening with hibernation. You have November captures right in there. You see the span 
uh, well, let's just, yeah, sorry, see the span there? This would be when they're going into hibernation like hibernacula right in there, okay? So the longevity potential there, average 60 to 90 days, so it's remarkably long-lived. It shows what's possible and how this potential is changing seasonally. Pre-hibernation transition, you can separate the factors out of physiological versus cool conditions. We have just physiology alone, they can make it through the next, uh, to almost April of the next year uh, without any cool temperatures at all. Age structure dynamics, this changes in frailty through the season may shed light on what interventions, uh, why they differ uh, seasonally, okay? Applications, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Mosquito vector monitoring, this is post-capture live, not just uh, count, count the number dead and dissections, but in fact have a subsample, uh, sub, uh, yeah, subsample that would be monitored through death, getting uh, different types of information. Use this in research, mosquito life shortening strategies, and use it in epidemiology. Now, the last major slide here is per, what I call pearls of uh, insect biodemography. And that is um, that um, these are sort of these uh, uh, nice, clean mathematical relationships. I think everybody uh, could know, but they're very simple. One is the immortality principle. A cohort subject to constant mortality is immortal. So that if you have constant mortality, a death rate in this case of 0.05, uh, the inverse of that is 20 days, but every day uh, of uh, individual life, you have 20 days more when it's constant, okay? And by the way, this is a vectorial capacity mo uh, model for the uh, medical entomologist here. It's basically the immortality principle is what the uh, vectorial capacity model is based on. Colony size principle. A colony's maximum size, NSAR, is a product of daily egg laying and worker longevity. So if a worker lives 40 days, it's about six weeks, lay a 1,000 eggs per day, which is what honeybee queens can lay, 40,000 workers. After that, it's basically running in place, just replacing those that die. A third principle, zero population, growth, uh, population control principle, zero population growth rate can be achieved only by killing at least one over lambda of the daily population. So if you have finite rate of increase of lambda, then one over that equal 0.83, you have to kill 83% of the individuals in that population to, uh, to control it. That is no growth, okay? That's a rule of thumb. And then the last one is this life lived and life left uh, principle. The number of individuals age X equals the number of individuals with X days to live uh, in a stationary insect population. I showed you that with this uh, life table identity, okay? Now, call to action. Let me just, I'm, uh, we're, I'm publishing a book with Debbie Roach from the University of Virginia. Just, it's about 80% done, so it's probably a year and a half, two years away. But just to give a perspective on uh, demography, we have the basics, we have life tables. There's huge potential for uh, expanding the use of life tables in uh, entomology. I list them there, some of the examples. Mortality, I've talked about. Reproduction, stable uh, uh, population theory, human demography, I'll skip through that. Visualizing demographic information, a whole chapter on that, applications and demography through problems. I'm going to skip through that right there, too. The future, I see biodemography of arthropod vectors. Look, medical and uh, veterinary and also plant pathology, huge potential to take the demographic foundations and theory concepts to a whole new other level uh, there. Uh, I see a lot of potential age structure is very important in vectoring, as, as everyone knows. Understanding age population, age structure, uh, but sorry, population structure writ large, not just age structure, is an important next step I see. Use of live captured insects. We've sort of started that, but I see that, it's, you know, dead insects tell some tales, but live insects tell a lot more. And I see a lot of uh, potential there for the use of live captured insects monitored through death and looking at different traits and so forth, besides just death, as having a lot of potential. Greater emphasis on the use of demographic theory, I think this is foundation, and also biodemography and teaching, IPM, biocontrol, med ent, ecology, and so forth. I think this could be integrated more deeply into uh, the uh, entomological pedagogy. Okay, acknowledgments, of course I want to acknowledge uh, Walter Leal, Alvin Simmons, and the selection committee for allowing, uh, asking me to give this, uh, this talk. I feel very honored. Uh, my closest entomological colleagues, of which I have many, but the close Pablo Lieto, Nikos Papadopoulos, Nikos Kalusis, uh, Byron Katsianos, and Roger Vargas, and why I started out with him, I did a lot of work with Roger early on. Of course, my students, postdocs, and colleagues, and of course also my uh, Department of Entomology at University of California, Davis. Okay, thank you very much. So.
thank you very much <laughs> for such a dynamic and exciting paper on insect demography. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alvin. Uh, I feel very honored to be giving this talk. So, okay? Okay. So, okay. Okay, we're good? Okay, we're good. Okay, thank you very much. Everyone have a wonderful uh, Congress. Thank you for coming.